All right, so now we're going to start talking about chemistry, meaning that we're going to start talking about the atom. Okay, the origins of atomism. Uh, this actually goes back to ancient Greece, you know, the BC era. Um, there were a lot of influential Greek philosophers. In this case, we're going to talk about the divide between Aristotle and Democritus. Uh, Aristotle thought that matter was infinitely divisible. You know, if you keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting matter into smaller pieces, then you'll never find a smallest piece of matter. Uh, Democritus um, held that matter was made of tiny bits that could not be cut anymore. Um, and that is actually the origin of uh, the term atom, because A means not or un- and then you have tomos, which is Greek for able to be cut, so cuttable. So an atom is literally uncuttable, something that cannot be divided any further. All right, so that's where uh, things remained as a philosophical argument for a really long time, because they just didn't have the data, they didn't have the understanding. Um, uh, Aristotle dominated for the next 2,000 years. The atomists remained a dedicated minority. Um, the domination of the Aristotelians was partly because the Catholic Church picked up Aristotle um, and uh, incorporated Aristotelian philosophy into church doctrine. This was difficult in some cases, but uh, in other cases it worked fairly well. Uh, the atomists uh, actually were uh, uh, synonymous with um, uh, atheists for a really long time. Um, they were they, they were monists. They they didn't believe in spirits or ghosts or the afterlife or the gods or anything like that, which is a, a, a pretty big slap in the face to a large chunk of the world. So they remained a minority. Um, it was in the uh, 17th century, I believe, that uh, somebody finally challenged that. It was a guy named Dalton, John Dalton, an Englishman, uh, who brought together um, the learning of the previous you know, centuries. Uh, and he looked at it and he you know, came to the conclusion that the atomic theory is correct. You know, it has nothing to do with spirits or anything like that. It's just that he looked at chemical reactions and how you know, elements behave and so on. And he realized, yeah, yeah, okay, atoms are the way to go. Um, and he concluded that all matter is made of indivisible particles known as atoms. Uh, these atoms are derived or divided into varieties known as elements. Uh, all atoms of an element are the same. All atoms of different elements are different. You know, he didn't have to specify. He didn't specify, and he didn't have to how they're different. He just said that they are different. Okay. Don't need to explain everything with a theory, just uh, enough that the theory works to explain stuff. Right? Um, so atoms combine in whole number ratios to form compounds with different properties. For example, uh, water is two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Um, carbon dioxide is one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen. Uh, table salt, sodium chloride, is one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. Okay, so um, they form in whole number ratios. That was really, okay, the whole number ratios thing, uh, was really what drove him to the conclusion that atomic theory had to be correct. Otherwise, it didn't make sense why reactions always proceed with the same quantities. And the other part is the other reason, in that uh, atoms can combine in different ratios to form different compounds with different properties. So just to take the most prolific of these, you have uh, nitric oxide, uh, uh, NO, one nitrogen and one oxygen. Then you can have dinitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. You can have nitrate, you can have nitrite, you can have uh, dinitrogen tetroxide, you can have dinitrogen pentoxide. <laughs> you can have a lot of compounds of nitrogen and oxygen. And they're all different. They have uh, different properties, different behaviors, uh, except for the fact that most of these are toxic. Um, you don't really want to breathe them in. Okay, so that is atomic theory. Those are the, uh, the five sort of laws that make up atomic theory. 
Now, Dalton didn't get it entirely correct. He, uh, we've since updated his theory to, to include a few other, um, uh, to, uh, uh, some corrections to his uh, theory. First off, we know that uh, atoms are divisible. They can be subdivided into subatomic particles. Uh, you know, know those as protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, how those were discovered and incorporated into atomic theory, we'll get that get to that in a bit. Um, uh, atoms are divided into varieties known as elements, and we now know how atoms of an element are all the same and how different elements are different. Um, the atoms of an element all have the same number of protons. So every atom of carbon has six protons. Six protons. Okay. Uh, every atom of oxygen will have, ooh, that was terrible, eight protons. So protons give an element its identity. Okay. Um, but they don't have to have the same number of electrons or neutrons. Okay. So carbon comes, for example, in two varieties. One has six neutrons, the other one has eight neutrons. Uh, so this is carbon-12, this is carbon-14. For those of you who uh, were really fond of dinosaurs when you were little kids, uh, this is what's responsible for carbon dating. Carbon-14 radio, carbon is uh, radioactive, carbon-12 is not. Um, but you can also have different numbers of electrons. Electrically neutral carbon will have six electrons, but you can also get uh, ions, so carbon-1 minus, with seven electrons, carbon two minus with eight electrons, carbon one plus with uh, five electrons, carbon two plus with four electrons, and so on. This should be a minus sign. I am terribly sorry. Okay, so different number of neutrons, it's called isotopes, and different number of electrons those, ooh, those are ions, but they all have the same number of protons. And that's how different elements are different. That's how all uh, atoms of an element are the same. All right, uh, next up, um, the whole number ratios bit. Um, that's that's mostly true. Um, alloys and ceramics uh, don't necessarily obey the thing about ratios. Okay? When you look at, say, steel, uh, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon, and sometimes they throw in other elements, you know, nickel, vanadium, you know, just things to give it slightly different properties or to make stainless steel, things like that. So, and those, they instead of talking about ratios, they talk about them in terms of percentages, you know, like 0 .9, 0 0.96 and 0.04, so 96% iron, nine and four uh, percent carbon, um, and they can vary very easily. <laughs> they can you know vary from one to another quite easily. Uh, there's there's no need for it to be a whole number ratio with uh, alloys or ceramics, but even so, they they're still made of atoms. So it's a good thing that he didn't think too deeply about steel. That would have uh, screwed things up for him quite a bit. Um, as I said, it's not perfect. It's uh, it, it's 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 darn good uh, uh, theory. It explains most of uh, atoms, um, and it, it explained most of the things they knew about chemical reactions and so on. And it laid the groundwork for further explanation, further explorations. It was. Uh, later research that came up with subatomic particles and, more importantly, the nature of chemical bonds. Okay. So the next thing was based on experiments. This was in the uh, 19th century, I believe. Uh, cathode ray tubes. Um, we we're specifically talking about experiments performed by another Englishman, J.J. Uh, Thompson. Uh, these over here on the right, these are a cathode ray tube. What you do is you, oh, excuse me, you apply a strong voltage to one side of the tube, 
Okay, that's what these wires are. They're hooked up to an electrical source. And eventually the voltage will build up enough that uh, electrons will be free to fly from one thing to another. Um, the tube itself is mostly empty. That's almost, but not quite, a vacuum. And this beam right here is actually made up of electrons. We know that now. They didn't know it then. They just knew that there was some sort of beam. You can see it very faintly there. Uh, and you can definitely see it hitting the end of the tube. You can also see it uh, blurring down here as it goes to the other, excuse me, end of the, uh, uh, to the other wire. Okay. So Thompson was playing around. Uh, he made the tube a vacuum, or almost vacuum, and he found that the beam responded to electric and magnetic fields. Um, you know, basically he just brought a magnet nearby, he brought a battery nearby, and the, and the field bent. So, thus, the, uh, uh, the beam is made of electrically charged particles. Okay. Uh, they didn't use the word particle back then, but we do now. A particle, uh, excuse me, uh, PTCL is my abbreviation. Uh, when I'm writing on a board or something, I tend to abbreviate it like that. Um, short for particle, and that just means a tiny bit of something. Just, you know, a dot. Um, so in this case, uh, the beam is made of some sort of charged particles, and because of the way it bent in response to magnetic fields, he was able to determine that these particles were very, very tiny. Uh, specifically, they had uh, a mass um, about 2,000 times less than uh, the hydrogen atom, which was the smallest atom that they knew of then, and it's still the smallest atom. It only has one proton, that's it. Um, so he realized that if it's incredibly small, much, much smaller than the uh, hydrogen atom, then it must be a subatomic particle. Um, they're all very small, they all have the same charge, and they're all the same. Um, he, uh, he called them, well, he didn't call them electrons, he called them corpuscles, I think it was. Um, but eventually they came to be called electrons. So this was the first modification to uh, Dalton's atomic theory, that atoms are made of uh, subatomic particles. They're not whole and indivisible. Um, so uh, uh, he came up with the plum pudding model, in that uh, sort of like pudding studded with bits of stuff, plum, in, this, in the case of the plum pudding. It, it, it's sort of like jello. Um, he proposed that the atom has a positive pudding studded with, you know, plums that were the tiny little electrons. Um, again, he's, he wasn't right, but it's okay, you know, you have to come up with some sort of model, you know, some way of saying, okay, if the atom is made of subatomic particles, then how are they put together, you know? Um, so he got electrons right, he got the model wrong, that's fine, so... The next uh, thing we go to, uh, we sort of take a step to the side, and we talk about uh, the Frenchman this time, Henri Becquerel, and his experiments with uranium. Um, uranium ore, actually. And he was playing around with it. They knew about radiation. They didn't know what it was. Uh, and uh, one time he got lucky. He uh, was, you know, coming to the end of the day, and he was just sort of tossing things in a drawer to clear off his workbench. Um, and he threw it in a drawer on top of some photographic plates. And when he came back the next day, he found that these photographic plates had somehow mysteriously been exposed, uh, as if they had been exposed to sunlight, but they'd been locked in a drawer, so there was no sunlight. And that's when he realized that uranium was emitting some kind of energy. Um, and there was no external energy source. You know, he would expose it to, uh, or, no, sorry, excuse me. Um, they knew it emitted some kind of energy, but um, this discovery was that it didn't need to absorb sunlight in order to do so. And that's what um, he discovered, yes. Um, no need for external energy. It will just continue to emit energy without being charged or anything. So that's how they discovered radioactivity. Specifically, he had uh, encountered alpha radiation. So there are three kinds of radiation, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, these are the main 
uh, forms of radiation. Uh, an alpha particle is um, a helium nucleus. Oh, well, we'll continue this next time. That was uh, my timer. I don't know if you can hear it, uh, telling me that this is 15 minutes. So we will continue further in lecture four.